welcome back to our show. Man, uh, we haven't had our radio show turn into a game show for, well, ever, Jim. That was fun. Thanks. Uh, you know, a lot of people might have do, do-it-yourself projects that they may want to do their own, do on their own. They may want to hire it out. But uh, ultimately, I guess it really depends on what kind of house you live in, whether it's new or old, or, and what you need done to maybe bring it up to speed. Michael Busaka joins us, broker with Skyline Properties, who's ranked in the top 10 in sales at that office every year since 2003. Uh, well, first of all, welcome back, Michael. How are you? I'm well. How about you, Ben? I'm good. Good Thanksgiving, you know, eat some turkey, do the whole thing. Absolutely. I only made four slices of pie this time, which is my record six. So I kind of feel like I let myself down. <laughs> <laughs> four slices of pie. Big slices, small slices? Oh, big slices after two full servings of dinner. Atta so <laughs> boy. Atta boy. What kind of pie? Uh, blackberry. Uh, thanks, Mom. And uh, pumpkin. <laughs> and then there was some kind of cobbler that... I don't know. I, I killed that brain cell. <laughs> Attaboy. <laughs> uh, well, Michael, you know, uh, Jim was just on talking about new versus old, uh, you know, getting, bringing houses up to speed, the projects people can do themselves, the tools they may need. And, uh, you know, a lot of this really, I guess, coming from the purely real estate side has to do with what type of house you're living in or you might want to fix up. And wh- what are some big differences between the new and old construction? Uh, there's a ton of differences. I could make this a three-part series, in fact. i uh, got to give credit to Jim for going over all the stuff that people should consider and stuff people shouldn't consider because as a broker, I go into a lot of classic homes, and they have been attacked by three or four amateurs in a row over their 80-year lifespan. And the new homeowner now has to come in and rectify all that madness, everything, electrical, plumbing, you name it, uh, poorly conceived kitchen remodels. So uh, please, folks, heed Jim's advice. Um, there's a saying, um, uh, fail to plan, plan to fail. And if you draw out your plan, run it by a pro and see what they say. Um, get some feedback from those in the know. Uh, they will let you know if you are taking on something that is outside your scope or is doable. And if it's in crayon? In crayon. It's probably not, probably not something you should execute, huh? <laughs> well, I, I can make a few builder jokes there, but uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, once again, the theme in the show is, you know, go with a pro, and I couldn't recommend it more highly. So let's get into what are some specific, maybe pieces or, or, or some aspects of a, an older home versus a newer home that, uh, you know, people tend to want to fix up a little bit. Um, or maybe they've done a poor job of fixing up. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I see, uh, you know, in comparing new versus old. So with new construction, uh, the electrical is never an issue. I mean, once in a blue moon, there might be one bad circuit. But in the old homes, consistently, the electrical is an issue. And I'll see all manner of mayhem. Uh, you'll see 200-amp service with an only 100-amp panel, vice versa. I mean, fire hazard there. There's a lot of older panels like Federal Pacific and Zinsco and even Sylvania, which bought them, which are a fire hazard. Um, get a good inspector who can spot those because I, I wouldn't spend one night in a home with those older panels. Now, the newer panels, I haven't heard of any issues. So electrical, absolutely go get a pro. So let me ask you, would you install an electrical panel on your own? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> not a chance. I mean, I'm very good at DIY, but number one, I'm not efficient. Number two, even after going through stuff, you know there's a learning curve, and you can't have a learning curve with electrical. It's not an option. Not not a real. You you still wouldn't sleep in that house, even with a new one poorly installed. No way. (laughs) What uh, you know, you uh, when you start thinking about the electrical, obviously that's a big piece. Are there any structural differences between the new and the old? Absolutely, and we talked about in the the prior show about concrete, but I want to talk about framing. So. Wood is not wood is not wood. When you go into an old home, let's say built from 1930 back to 1900, that was most likely built with old growth. And the density density of that lumber will never be replicated again. Um, you can almost not even drive a nail in the stuff. You almost need a drill to put an anchor in there. Um, and what that does, that wood is so dense that you see, let's say in roof framing, you'd see only two by four rafters on a wide spacing of two feet on center. Compared to with the same pitch roof, modern construction, you would have two by tens on 16 inch centers. So the density of the wood allows you to um, completely uh, underbuild back in that day. And in this day, a home inspector wouldn't allow it at all. You wouldn't even get out of the county. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with the mid-century homes, you have good second-growth lumber, 
which uh, is is very stout. And then with the newer generation, I'd say the last 30 years, this quality of lumber is third growth, and it is it looks like balsa wood. It's that's the stuff you go buy the two by fours at, at Home Depot. It, exactly, and you feel like you can lift them with a finger. Um, you pick up an older piece of wood, and you'll know it. It feels three times as heavy because it's that dense. So. With the new stuff being of that poor quality, they've started to engineer, um, like, say, a floor joist. It looks like a mini I-beam, and they actually have labs at universities, and they engineer this stuff so it compensates for the lack of wood quality. Hmm. So a lot of it is the quality maybe has gone down, or the, as you say, the density of the wood has gone down, but they have, have better technology around it, as in, like, joists, to actually, I guess, compensate for the strength. Exactly. The engineering has come such a long ways. And so with any structural member in a house, you have four different types of loads. You have tension, compression, torsion, and shear. Uh, tension is a pulling force, a ripping force. Tension is what we use steel for or wood. Uh, compression is just a pushing force. It's the house sitting on the foundation. Um, and that's why we have concrete, which works great in compression and is useless in tension. That's why we have rebar and concrete, to handle the pulling force. Torsion is a twisting force, which would only happen in high wind situations, or once again, seismic. And the last one, shear, is something that's been engineered a lot in the last 20 years. Shear is a ripping force, and tough to describe over the air, but basically... I mean, it's probably like ripping a piece of paper, opposite ends. Exactly. And so uh, if you go to get uh, plan sets approved at the county, they're going to make sure you have the proper number of shear walls in there. Um, and they never did that in the old homes. Now, what the shear walls do account for something that's called a live load. In the lab, when you look at the weight of the home sitting on the foundation, that's just dead load. Live load is when you have 70 partiers in a home and you have 60 mile an hour winds coming and there's snow and ice built up on the roof. That is a lot of additional stresses on the home. So that's what these engineers look at, worst case scenario. 70 people at a party with snow on the roof, man. I'm coming to your house. Make it 71. <laughs> Not partying on the roof, <laughs> partying within the structure. But you, you get the picture. Yeah, well, I'll party on the roof with you. <laughs> uh, we're here with Michael Busaka. Michael, um, you know, the structure piece is big, but a lot of people would never take on Ever as a idea, you know, do it yourself. I'm gonna just start rebeaming my home with, you know, or <laughs> or whatnot. Um, but some things that you did bring up, some of the design differences, maybe, which is really what you're seeing, right? I mean, you see the design with your eyes. Maybe it's a kitchen, maybe it's a bathroom. Uh, where do you kind of see the differences in what some of the older older homes versus the newer homes? Yeah, that's definitely what uh, most house buyers are going to look at. I mean, people are definitely not going to DIY engineer. That's <laughs> begging for disaster. <laughs> um, but when you go shop for an old classic home, people fall in love with the style, the trim, all that subtle attention to proportion. The newer homes don't have that so much, but what they do have are, let's say, big, expansive kitchens. You want a big kitchen um, where you can cook up a storm, Thanksgiving, what have you, and a kitchen with an island, proper ceiling height for extra cabinet depth, things like that. That you will get. The older homes you won't. You'll also, in the newer homes, you'll have a washer dryer right near the master suite or on the bedroom level versus the older homes. You're probably taking that laundry down a couple of flights of stairs. And, and, and I'll tell you, that has got to be the, and it just really started happening what, in the last maybe five years. Yep. That has to be the smartest change of a design concept is putting the laundry room where all the clothes are that uh, ever. It, it, exactly. You make, it makes you wonder why they didn't do it back in the, in the early days. But of course, some of these homes are designed back before there's even indoor plumbing. So there's, <laughs> we've come <laughs> so a long way. We're, we're worried about the washer and dryer, huh? <laughs> um, another thing, too, uh, you will see uh, proper egress windows. Uh, a lot of these old homes, uh, you, you just hope the window isn't painted shut. And of course, in a fire and you have a, some type of furniture, you're going to break out that window in a worst case scenario. But Uniform Building Code doesn't want that. They want a window max 42 inches off the floor and a minimum, I believe, it's 6.4 square feet of opening space um, because the assumption is that in a fire, the fire will be at the door and you need to go out the quickest route to escape. So you'll see that versus the old homes. You'll also see smaller details like closet proportions. You may see a gorgeous brick Tudor home that is just as appealing, instantaneously appealing as you can find, 
But when you go inside, you'll think, okay, th- these people had two pairs of pants and three shirts, and that's their entire wardrobe. Nowadays, uh, all of this constructions, new constructions built with modern wardrobes in mind. The uh, another big thing, I mean, and, and in fact, we've talked about that with some of uh, uh, with uh, Paul Valley, who comes on from Organized Spaces sometimes. And, I mean, the difference in in closets is incredible, and it's a huge selling point. Huge selling point. Um, if if somebody comes to me and says, "Mike, I want a home on Queen Anne. I want to build in 1909, and I want a master suite," I'm going to have to take them to something close, and then bring in, have them get an architect, and have them take it to the next level because they just weren't originally built like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that you know that's something I want to advise to people when if you really don't want the new construction because you don't want to live all the way out, let's say Duval, someplace like that, Woodville, you want to live on Capitol Hill, you've got two choices. You can find that old home and bring in an architect and an engineer, or you can find a knockdown and because there's no vacant lots really left and uh, knock down a small dilapidated structure. Keep in mind, you will then have the best of all worlds. You will have that design you love. You will have modern uh, seismic codes, uh, heat loss codes. You'll be able to walk to all your favorite restaurants, but you're going to be waiting a while who knows, uh, 12 to 18 months. And then also, uh, it will cost quite a bit. So patience I would, I would imagine money. retrofitting a, a 1900s, early 1900s home to meet modern day amenities as well as codes is a big project. Oh, yeah. Make no mistake. Uh, once again, it's a pros only. Um, just even stuff like what Jim mentioned with drywall. I mean, there's so many ways to get drywall wrong. Um, and I'm someone with a lot of tools. I feel confident in my ability to use tools, but I would call a drywaller in a second. I, the best tool for uh, amateurs is the phone. Pick up the phone, <laughs> call those in the know, and keep moving. I'm stealing that one from you. I love it. Hey, uh, thanks so much for joining us, Michael. Really appreciate you having you. Stick around for a few minutes. Uh, we'll continue the conversation, bring Jim back, and uh, – See what else we have up our sleeves. We'll be back after this break.